<laughs> In Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather, the powerful Corleone crime family is run by its cunning, wise, and intelligent founder Don Vito Corleone, played by Marlon Brando. A Sicilian immigrant, Don Corleone built his empire over decades, putting politicians and law enforcement into his pocket along the way. As a man who valued loyalty, Vito is generous to his friends and allies, and he's a loving father and husband. Having lost his parents and brother to mafia violence in Sicily, Vito values family above all else. Before we continue, please consider subscribing to the channel, and if you've already subscribed, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on future videos. You can also support the channel by becoming a Patreon, which includes exclusive perks such as early video access. During Vito's rise to power, he befriended two low-level hoodlums in New York's Little Italy, Peter Clemenza and Salvatore Tessio, the three forming a long-running partnership that would continue for decades, with Clemenza and Tessio both becoming capo regimes, or captains, to Don Vito in his criminal family. Aside from Genko Abandano, a trusted friend of Vito who had become his advisor and consigliere, no two men have ever been closer to Vito than Clemenza and Tessio, with both rising in stature with Don Vito Corleone. Even as a hoodlum, Tessio was a connected guy, known for being savvy, smart and extremely dangerous. He played a major role in the olive oil war between the Corleone family and its enemies, as he was personally responsible for the execution of Vito's main enemy, Don Giuseppe Mariposa, the most powerful gangster in New York at the time. Between him and Clemenza, Tessio is known to be far more cunning and smarter. Whilst Clemenza often wore his heart on his sleeve, being outspoken, emotional, jovial and unafraid to voice his opinion, Tessio was far more quieter and calculating, and much more intelligent also. He was able to read situations instantaneously, and understand things when nothing was said. For example, upon the trio's rise to power, Vito told Tessio and Clemenza that both should not meet together socially, telling them that this was due to security and protection. But Tessio understood that this was actually to prevent the two men from plotting against their boss. Tessio owned a social club in Brooklyn, which was his base of operations. When Vito needed men and soldiers, he would use Clemenza's, and Tessio's business was so detached from Vito's that many in law enforcement and La Cosa Nostra thought that he ran a completely separate organisation, a narrative which was often used to the Corleone's advantage. In fact, there is actually a deleted scene, one that I've discussed heavily in a separate video, where Sonny calls Tessio and asks for 50 good men, specifically stating he does not want to use Clemenza's men. This shows that Tessio's regime would not orthodoxly be used in Corleone operations, and Sonny doesn't want to use Clemenza's men because he knows there's a traitor amongst them, and the fact that Tessio doesn't question the decision not to use Clemenza's soldiers speaks volumes of his sharpness because he clearly knows what the score is without having to be told. Tessio has always been sharper than Clemenza, and he has always thought to have been the more loyal of the two. If any one of the duo was going to betray the Corleones, it would be Clemenza. As suggested in the scene where he practically begs Don Vito to start his own family, as he and Tessio do not trust the leadership abilities of Vito's son Michael, who becomes the new head of the family after Vito slips into semi-retirement. It's highly ironic then, that when the time comes that one of the capos does betray the family, it's Tessio of all people. Consigliere Tom Hagen doesn't see it coming, just like he didn't see Don Barzini pulling the strings during the Salozzo business, but Michael calmly accepts the fact that Tessio is able to betray the family, simply stating, Tessio was always smarter. Tessio thought highly of Michael, but he did not think he was powerful enough to keep the family going as his father's heir. Both Clemenza and Tessio were seeing their territory stomped on by their powerful rival Don Barzini, with them not being able to do anything about it. So ultimately, Tessio plots against Michael, coming to him at Vito's funeral with an offer for a peace summit set up by Barzini on Tessio's turf. But of course, it's a trap for Michael, and he will be assassinated. Tessio's reward for this is thought to be the inheritance of the Corleone crime family, which on a greater scale would be absorbed by Barzini. As Michael implies, it's a smart move on Tessio's part. The Corleone family is clearly a sinking ship. Michael is incompetent as the head of the family and it's only a matter of time before he's bumped off. So Tessio has obviously calculated the odds and decided that joining Barzini is the way to go. Who could have possibly foreseen that Michael, who hadn't been in the family business long, would be as ruthless and intelligent as he ended up becoming? However, unbeknownst to Tessio, 
the upper echelons of the Corleone crime family were planning their revenge against Barzini, with the likes of Rocco Lampone building secret regimes and Vito, before his death, advising Michael that one of his men will surely come to him with a peace offer from Barzini, but it would be a trap and this man would be a traitor. The Corleones were cunning and they saw a betrayal coming a mile away. It was only a matter of whether it'd be Clemenza or Tessio. Tessio, always one step ahead of his enemies, came up short this time and he sealed his fate. As Tessio and Tom Hagen prepare to attend the peace summit, Willy Chichi arrives and informs them that Michael would be coming in a separate car. Tessio is upset, saying, hell, he can't do that, it screws up all my arrangements, which is a pretty disrespectful way of talking about your boss, further highlighting Tessio's betrayal. Tom says, I can't go either, Sal, and steps away. Men surround Tessio, and immediately the aging viper knows what it is, that the game is up. He tells Tom to tell Michael that it was only business, that he always liked him, and he then tries one last ditch effort at saving his life by asking Tom if he can get him off the hook for old time's sake. When he's turned down, he accepts his fate like a man, showing incredible mental strength and class to simply walk away and get in a car with the men who are about to kill him. Such is the dignity that the character of Salvatore Tessio emits that his death is never shown in the film, unlike other traitors like Carlo and Pauli, and the enemies of the Corleones like Barzini and Tatalia. So how was Tessio executed? From what we see in the film, it's left to our imagination, but at the very least we know he wasn't garroted like Carlo because he gets into the back seat of the car. Maybe they didn't kill him, and instead exiled him and had him work at a fast food restaurant called Good Burger. Jokes aside, there's no chance that Sal could have been left off the hook. First off, it would be completely against Michael's cold and unforgiving character, who even later has his own brother killed for going against the family. Secondly, it would set a precedent that betrayal can be forgiven. All of a sudden, you'd have other Corleone underlings thinking they could carry out treason and get away with it. Betrayal must be punished. Interestingly, in the book, Tom actually wants to help Tessio, and it's actually him that asks if there's any way Tessio can be left off the hook, as the Corleones, in a manner of speaking, have forced Tessio into this position of betrayal. In a conversation with Michael before Tessio gets clipped, Michael adamantly refuses, and pressing the subject could get Tom into trouble, so he drops it. But it makes this scene a lot sadder to know that someone the Corleones respect and love has to take his medicine for his betrayal, and even he knows it, which is why he takes it like a boss. Some Godfather fans might make something of Tom pulling at his necktie after watching Tessio get into the car, implying he's seeing Tessio get strangled. Personally, I don't think too much of that. Loosening your tie is quite a normal and natural reaction after a stressful endeavour. And plus, Tessio was in the back seat. Unless the Corleones had a goon lying uncomfortably in the boot of the car, I don't see a way of easily strangling a guy who's sitting at the back. So, would Tessio be given a quick and painless death for his contributions to the family? Or would he be dealt with painfully for the unforgivable act of betrayal? Well, it does seem there is an answer. If we ignore the Godfather video game, in which after being driven to a club to be executed, Tessio makes a last stand with Barzini assassins before being killed by Aldo Trapani, an answer as to how Tessio died is showcased in The Godfather Returns, a sequel novel to The Godfather written by Mark Weingardner and published in 2004. You can find out more about this book and its sequel The Godfather's Revenge in my reviews on them on the channel. The man who is given the job of killing Tessio is Nick Gerechi, a character with his own interesting story, but one that would need to be covered in another video, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Gerechi eventually becomes the primary antagonist for Michael Corleone in The Godfather Returns and The Godfather's Revenge, but at this point in the story, he is a soldier in Tessio's regime, a well-regarded rising star who's made his bones and was put in charge of narcotics operations by Michael Corleone. Michael Corleone calls Gerechi personally, and says he wants him there, with Gerechi not entirely sure if he'll be whacked as well. Gerechi could see why Tessio would turn against Michael. He felt Tessio must have been angry at the nepotism Vito showed to Michael, the inadequate decision of handing over a crime empire to an untested college boy. Gerechi is picked up by Peter Clemenza and told in so many words that he will be carrying out the hit. Essentially it's a test of loyalty for Gerechi, and Clemenza is driven away before the hit, as he tearfully tells Gerechi that he and Sally go way back. Some things a man just don't want to see, you know, he says. The book goes on to tell us. Inside, towards the back of the first filthy service bay, two corpses in jumpsuits lay in a heap, 
their blackening blood oozing together on the floor. In the next bay, flanked only by Al Neri, Michael's new pet kill and an ex-cop Gerecio had some history with, was Salvatore Tessio. The old man sat on a case of oil cans, hunched over, staring at his shoes like an athlete removed from a game that was hopelessly lost. His lips moved, but it was nothing Gerecio could understand. He trembled, but he had some kind of condition and had been trembling for a year now. There was only the sound of Gerecio's own footsteps and, wafting in from another room, thin, distorted laughter that could only come from a television set. Neri nodded hello. Tessio did not look up. Neri put a hand on the old warrior's shoulder and squeezed, a gesture of grotesque reassurance. Tessio fell to his knees, still not looking up, lips still moving. Neri handed Gerechi a pistol, but first. Gerechi wasn't good with guns and didn't know much about them. This one was heavy as a cash box and long as a tent spike, a lot more gun than seemed necessary. He'd been around long enough to know that the weapon of choice in matters like this was a point twenty two with a silencer. Three shots to the head, the second to make sure, the third to make extra sure, and no fourth because silencers jam when you fire too many shots too fast. Whatever this was, it was bigger than a point twenty two. No silencer. He stood in that dark garage with Tessio, a man he loved, and Neri, who'd once cuffed him, chained him to a radiator, punched him in the balls and gotten away with it. Nick Gerechi took a deep breath. He'd always been a man who followed his head and not his heart. The heart was just a bloody motor. The head was meant to drive. He'd always thought there'd come a time when he was old and set, when he would move away to Key West with Charlotte and play the affluent fool. Now, looking at Tessio, he realised that would never happen. Tessio was twenty-some years older than Nick Gerechi, which until that moment seemed like a long time. Tessio had been born in the last century. He would die in the next minute. He'd lived his life governed by his head and not his heart. And where had it gotten him? Here. A man who loved him was about to reduce that same head to blood and pulp. I'm sorry, Tessio muttered, still looking down. This might have been directed at the Corleones or Gerechi or at God. Gerechi certainly didn't want to know which. He took the gun and walked around behind Tessio whose bold spot, lit only by the streetlights, gleamed in the darkness. No, Neri said. Not like that. In front. Look him in the eyes. You're fucking kidding me. He cleared his throat. I don't suppose I look like I'm kidding you. Whose idea is that? Gerechi said. Neri didn't have a gun in his hand, but Gerechi could not leave this scummy garage alive if he shot anyone but Tessio. From that back office, the television set erupted in a gale of timely applause. Don't know, don't care, Neri said. I'm just the messenger, sir. Gerechi cocked his head. This dumbass didn't seem witty enough to make a joke about shooting the messenger, but he did seem sadistic enough to take it on himself to make the killing as cruel as possible. And sir? How did he mean that? Salvatore Tessio, Gerechi said, no matter what he's done, deserves more respect than that. Fuck yous, Tessio said, loud now, but eyes still on the slimy floor. Look up. Neri ordered Tessio. Traitor. Trembling no worse, the old man did as he was told, eyes dry, staring into Gerechi's but already far away. He muttered a rapid string of names that meant nothing to Nick Gerechi. Gerechi raised the gun, both sickened and grateful for the sight of his own steady hand. He pressed the barrel gently against the old man's soft forehead. Tessio did not move, did not blink, did not even shake anymore. His saggy flesh pillowed around the gun sight. Gerechi had never before killed a man with a gun. Just business, Tessio whispered. What are you waiting for? Tessio whispered. Son of a tuta, shoot me, you pussy. Gerechi shot. Tessio's body flew backwards so hard his knees made a sound like snapped roof shingles. The air was filled with a glowing pinkish grey mist. A Yarmulk-sized piece of Tessio's skull caromed off the wall of the garage, smacked Neri in the face and clattered to the floor. The tang of Tessio's airborne blood mixed with the smell of his shit. Nick Gerechi rubbed his shoulders. The pistol kick was like a savage right cross and felt a wave of europhia was over him, obliterating the hesitation he'd felt. He felt no remorse, no fear, no disgust, no anger. I am a killer, he thought. Killers kill. 
So there you have it. Tessio's body is left where it is, which happens to be Barzini territory. So the cops would assume the hit was ordered by the Barzini family. There was no need to send a message to Don Barzini at this time because, of course, Barzini himself was already dead. I'm not the biggest fan of The Godfather Returns, as people who have seen my review will know. I've got a lot of problems with it, but this scene was by far one of my favourites in the novel. The resilience of Tessio in his final moments, the coldness of the killer Al Neri, everything was on point. You might be interested to know that the two corpses were a duo assigned to kill Michael. Their bodies are mutilated and stuffed into suitcases, but Tessio's is left alone after his death, perhaps as some kind of sign of respect to the old viper. So what do you think of the way Tessio is murdered in The Godfather Returns? Do you like how it was handled, or do you prefer not knowing? Let me know in the comments below, subscribe to the channel, and thanks for watching.